What if I double suplex choke slam you? Mm, that's pretty ambitious. You can't even touch the ceiling. I can too touch the ceiling. I'm Kat Zingano. I'm the first mom in the UFC octagon. I'm the first winner of a women's TKO and the first fight of the night. I'm a professional fighter and I am a full-time mom. This is Double Duty. about cutting is walking in and being the big one um, and the worst part is feeling like crap but hopefully a lot of times the other big ones feel like you feel so it's still even <laughs> you know so it balances out I became interested in combat sports when I was about 12 years old I had always been athletic, always been really into sports. I played soccer, I was a swimmer, I was a dancer. I liked track, um, volleyball. Just really competitive and I was kind of a quiet kid and, and a shy kid and you know I could, once I was comfortable I could talk, 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 but it, it took me a while to get there and um, one of the ways that I, I really could kind of let go and just emote and be who I was was in sports. And um, I always asked my parents to put me in sports. Um, they were down, but it wasn't them putting me in things. It was me asking to be put in things. And, you know, even as a currency where it was like, oh, well, if you want to do swim team, then, you know, you need to get these kind of grades. And if you want to, you know, do soccer as the same time as swim team, you know, we need to make sure that you're, you know, doing all your chores and having everything ready by this time and whatever. So it was definitely a bargaining tool for them, which I think is smart with parenting, you know, is finding out what's important to your kids and, and using that. I started being athletic at a really young age and um, it was definitely an identity for me and a way I could like express myself. It kind of gave me an out too. I mean we had we had some trouble kind of going on in, in my house when I was little. Like my, my parents had some struggles and as kids it's hard to know exactly what to do when those are going on and I really felt like I got to deal with it and get it out on a field or in a pool or, or whatever. The wrestling coach was one of those like busters in the cafeteria. He's like the you know grown man that makes sure everybody's behaving and whatever and um, you know, he, he saw my tendencies in, in sports that I was like a little bit more aggressive. Like I was doing the slide tackles that probably didn't need a slide tackle. You know, I was, you know, uh, just really, really committed and hard on myself for how I did. And he would tell me, um, you know, that I should come out for wrestling. And there wasn't girls there. There was a couple that had tried it, you know, but um, that he thought I'd be good at it. And as strong as I was and as fast as I was and the kind of endurance I had that it would be cool and he thought I had the personality to do it so um, I went but something about wrestling it was just like the most intense thing I had ever seen it was the hardest like both mentally physically emotionally that you needed to be in order to be good at this and and to me it felt completely fascinating and and again because I identified so much with like physicality and sports and like that was my language that was my way of you know expressing myself I had like my first couple of practices and I was so I remember being so uncomfortable with like touching and like like you're a girl and I had parts on me that were soft and like these are buff dudes that I'm going against and I was told that if you can put them on their back and hold them there for three seconds it's over you won all of the technique and all of the skill and everything that went into that was like only a suggestion if you could just like find a way to like trip them up or this or that or whatever, but you get them to their shoulders and you hold them there, it's done and you won. And so um, even to this day, like I have an extremely scrambly style because I train with concepts. If I tie these people's feet up, they're gonna fall. And if they fall and I get to this position, they're gonna have a hard time getting me off. And all of that, um, became like the wizardry of how it worked for me. It wasn't so technical. It wasn't so like by the book and everything has to be this way. I had to learn how to wrestle as a girl against guys and use the differences in my body to my advantage against the strengths in their body. Like I was never as strong as them. You know, I was more flexible though and I had a, a different center of gravity and there was definitely a different intensity 
you know, found what was different between me and them and I totally used it to my advantage and before you knew it I was winning matches and I was the person in the room that people whispered about when I came in because not only was I coming in and doing well and no one knew exactly what and how I was doing it, but like I was earning the respect. You know, when I first went in, it was like, who's this girl? Oh my God, my son has to wrestle this girl, or you know, how unfair or how wrong. And this was all during Title IX as well. So it was like, they had to let me there, which is not my personality to be like, well, you have to. You know, there was things going on outside of my life that felt very out of control. So when I was able to come into this and find a way to control things and control people and control my feelings and emotions and style and whatever, like that, brought some kind of peace to me. I also did, and it's a big secret, but I did tap dancing as well, all the way from four years old until 18. And I would go to wrestling, and then I would go to tap dance after wrestling. But that was like, you don't tell anyone about that. <laughs> and 2001 was the year I graduated. Right before I graduated, they said they were going to allow four weight classes of women into the Olympics in 2004. So that became the focus. That became everything. And I was winning big tournaments. So by that time, I was a, a national champion. I was an All-American. They were bringing in all of these, uh, like, really really good women that also came up wrestling men and it was so surprising to me to get my hands on these girls that were just like me like they had just the amount of hardships that I had to go through as far as being the girl that had to prove themselves in the room and not only go from like bottom of the barrel I know nothing to now being one of the good ones it's now being looked at as a captain to now being all that like that was amazing to me to find girls that were at as good as me and better. Like getting beaten by a girl for the first time was so weird for me. <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, I get this. All right, we should get going. So you need, you can probably wear the shorts for both, but bring another t-shirt in case you're sweaty. Gross, ooh, okay. And then uh, your running shoes. Sure. Two thousand, I guess two thousand. Um, I had a, a rough time because one of my best friends, she she actually got she got murdered. I don't know that I like understood how much it affected me because it did change me in my drive. You know, it did change like the fact that I was feeling depressed and um, I kind of always thought she was gonna be there for everything and I thought like we were gonna go to the same college and I thought all that stuff so. That was a big hit and like when I look back now, it was like that hit me a lot harder than I was feeling in the moment. But in the moment I was just in, in survival and I was just in being freaked out and, uh, and being sad. And 2004 came and I was in these different wrestling programs. I had had a couple knee surgeries, still trying to come out of those. But um, I did this really big international tournament in early 2004. It was just crazy because at the end of that, tournament I did a good job I, I beat a couple countries I placed I was just like I feel like I'm done like I just feel like I don't I don't know I don't know if I want to do this anymore I watched all these people that I used to compete against these people that I used to beat go and go to the trials and go to the Olympics and just that was it you know to this day I still kind of feel like I want my I want to have a retirement match where I get to go like leave my shoes on the mat and like have my final wrestling match and you know close that chapter but um, it's been a long time 
and I still use it. Like I still come to wrestling practice. And I still use it in my fights. I'm still notorious in my fights for being such a good wrestler. And like, there's nothing I love hearing better than, oh, she's got the best takedowns or oh, she does the best throws or oh, you gotta watch out for her here and there because of her wrestling. Like, that's purpose. You know what I mean? That's, that's what that was there for, was the purpose. Things happen the way they're supposed to happen and then they manifest and you know, I'm here being great at all these things because of what I was willing to try when I was younger. When I stopped wrestling, like I had this crazy void because it was an identity for me. It was a really big part of my life. That was all my friends. That was where I met all my coaches. My teammates were like my family. And now we weren't gonna be going and sitting in these tournaments for the weekends and that be our social thing. Like that was my social life. It was my like family life. You know, it was, there was a lot there. And then my mom was diagnosed with cancer. She was diagnosed with brain cancer um, in the end of 2004, early 2005. That was just like this crazy transition of years and I didn't have this outlet. Like I didn't have the thing that I do when I have this stress. Like I, I tried to, you know, go to like dance classes. Like I tried to like, do weird workouts like honestly I was lost and probably not making the best decisions with my body or my time or my you know people when my mom got sick you know it all put things into a, a even more of a tailspin because I was like my rock like my mom and me were very close and so she passed away in October on, on Halloween 2005 and um, same day found out I was pregnant with my boy I had to change my life and have a good life and you know even seeing my mom I was like mom you don't have to worry about me I'll be okay and that was like the the trade-off was it was like well I will make sure you're okay like no yeah you get a baby having him was like so much purpose again you know so much drive for me because I really wanted to be able to give him a good life I really wanted him to have everything he wanted and needed and I was on my own and probably one of my best memories of my life was uh, I had a baby shower my sister threw for me. All these people came that were friends of my mom but I didn't like know them, I wasn't super close to them. They were wonderful people and, and the, you know an extension of my mother which felt amazing. Halfway through the baby shower right around when it's time to start opening gifts my coaches and my wrestling teammates crashed my baby shower and they showed up and they like made my life. Like they were sitting there every time some, I would open a package, they were like, oh, it's so cute. And like brought butt paste and like all of the baby stuff. Like it was really just the sweetest thing. And that day my coach wrote me a letter and he was like, I would absolutely love to be one of the grandparents to your son if you want it and if you allow it. And I was just like, so touched by that. And he has stood by his word. He's never left our side. to get into a bigger house and have a room for all of this stuff. Uh, I want a mat room and be able to put my sauna places. But um, really there's just a lot of memorabilia here from things that I've done in this crazy MMA career. Colorado Professional Fighter of the Year. I mean this whole thing is medals and medals and medals and I really feel like I'm keeping it all for him for some day if he wants it to, or to do something with it. Like I'm not, um, like I see a value in it and I'm sure when I retire, like I'll feel a little bit more <clears throat> sentimental about them uh, as far as being materialistic. I mean, these are, these are shorts from my, uh, I think second title. This is one of my fights at 125 pounds. I fight at 145 pounds now, so that's a 
you know, a trek ago. But this is from one of my Thai fights in Thailand. Uh, this is one of the only fights I let Brayden come to because he was there in Thailand. But um, it motivated me to have him in there and watching. And when the fight was over, right around this time, I looked over and he was asleep. <laughs> I think the adrenaline just got to him and you know he was excited about everything that he was seeing, but you know, it popped up, it was over, and he was ready to go. On one hand, I want to keep everything so my son will be able to decide what to do with it. I, I do believe it will probably mean more to me later when I'm not in the middle of it, because right now these are just things I have to store. But, you know, my mom did the same kind of thing. She kept all my wrestling stuff, just jujitsu. And I will, I will definitely say, I see it in myself, I see it in my son too, is being a medals chaser, like, I loved going and, and getting these and being on a podium and you know having a great day after running through a bunch of people and and all of the nerves that goes into it and all of the the you know the wins, the losses, the the training, the preparation. This was one of my first belts that I won. Uh, that was also the last time I made 125 pounds. It was too much to cut that weight for this one, and that was the last time. And after that, I committed I had to go up to 135 pounds, and then 145 pounds later. Brayden has literally been like this gift to my life that honestly has saved my life a couple times. So patient, just such a, a good boy. And over and over again, it's just giving me direction. Like we feel like as parents, like we're guiding these kids and, and my son has been such a guide for me because it's like, okay, what do I need to do to be a good mom to my son? What decision do I need to make right now to have it be right for my kid? Like it, it's, this chicken before the egg conversation with myself all of the time because what's best for my kid has always ended up being what's best for me and like I I didn't have that direction in my life my whole life was just like I don't know let's try this and if I don't die cool and if I do die whatever you know like I really never had that I don't know that organization and that that drive and that yeah direction that I that I that I have because I have a son someone that I care about so much someone that I just need so much and I want him happy more than anything in the world. It's crazy to see him grow so much. It's crazy to see him as a, a sophomore in high school, you know, and, and just the road that it's taken to get here. And some days I feel like I'm guessing at parenting, you know, and it really sucks when you screw up and you miss the mark, but like when you hit it right, it feels so good. And, and you know, some days I feel like I got to play with him like I'm, I'm an older sister because he doesn't have siblings. Some days I got to try to be a dude and like wrestle him and flex with him and like whatever because I, he doesn't have a dad. And, um, you know, and then I have to have the like very nurturing mother side and, you know, be cuddly and caring and whatever, but then also I have to put my foot down, you know, so it's, you know, this huge balance of trying to be as many things to him as I think I'm supposed to be, you know, making life fun and, and making life, you know, disciplinary and making him like brave and, you know, helping him move through everything that we've been through. And it's a lot of guessing and a lot of trying and like, I, I wish there was a book, you know, but there's not. And, um, you know, you always just do your best and do what you think you're supposed to do. And that's what I'm doing. And um, I've never loved something so much in my life. Like he really is, he's, he's everything. And I'm so surprised every day at how important these kids can be to us. You know, it's, it's crazy. So we're gonna start in first. So put it in neutral. Now feel my feet, see that one's down. First, all right, feel how I'm letting off on the gas or letting off on the clutch and onto the gas. Okay, stay on the edge. Now go left. Start to go left. Good. So, you gonna wrestle me today? Mm -hmm. 
you know, <laughs> you know when. Hmm. What are you gonna win with? Everything. Everything? I'm gonna cradle you. What if it turns into jujitsu? This kid grew nine inches and 45 pounds since January 2020. Back in eighth grade, I wasn't even five feet tall yet. Yeah, everybody was getting big and he was worried. I was like, it'll hit you. It'll hit you like a ton of bricks, I promise. Over the pandemic and being quarantined at home, I think it was just this sleep and all of the eating and the rest. And um, I was able to get in with a coach and we did little workouts and then, you know, got into lifting and he started noticing his body changing, which made him want to lift more. And yeah, it turned into a little beast really quickly. Parenting is... <laughs> it's, it's so tricky, right? It's, it's like the most wonderful thing in the world. You've, so rewarding and so hard sometimes. Like you think you're doing the right thing and then later you find out you weren't, but like your effort was there and your intention was there. I don't know, you just have to go with the flow and really try and do your best and really let your kids teach you. It's, it's a hard thing. It's definitely the trickiest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, mistakes feel awful and the good times feel amazing. And the best noise in the world to this day is still hearing my son laugh. You know, if you always put what is best for them first, it'll always be what's best for you. Whether that's people, places, decisions, you know, and it's not always that easy. Sometimes you gotta flip a coin on some stuff, having different angles and, and not always, and admitting you don't always know everything. Asking questions, asking people that are smarter than you, people that you look at and you're like, I like how you did that. Can you, can you help me? I'm feeling stupid on something, you know? And I think, I think being vulnerable and realizing and admitting you don't have all the answers, but going for it as far as asking anyone anything. People that you respect. <laughs> Watch out for the ones you don't, because <laughs> they'll tell you all kinds of stuff.